Excellent. Cool. Well, welcome to the last session at DevOps. And I thank you very much for choosing me over the others. Um, this will be the scariest talk happening at this time. Well, OK. So this is the talk. I'm going to talk to you about Java vulnerabilities. OK. So me, well, I work for IBM. Um, I'm a Java runtimes guy. I do VMs done for a long time. Uh, but I've also do DevOps. And this talk comes about of another talk that I used to do about cybercrime. So a few years ago, I, did, uh, I went off and did some DevOps. I led a large DevOps team in IBM. And I learned a lot about how our operation guys looked at uh, development teams. And they didn't really like what they saw. And I was going, no, you don't understand. And then I have conversations with them. And I start learning about things like compliance, in other words. And I realized that actually, it's really scary. And so I did some talks about cybercrime in general. And one of the things people get asking was, can you give us some examples of code? Because we're all very cagey about sharing stuff. So this talk is going to talk about Java vulnerabilities. I'm going to touch about some of the processes. And I'm going to show you some example codes. And I'm also going to give you a little bit about why this is important. And I know it's becoming important to us because there are enough talks at uh, DevOps or other conferences about security that it's really good that stuff is starting to bubble up. So I'll give you some pointers about where else to go to look for, for more information. So let's start with the really simple thing, a bit of code. So this is a diff. And there's a, it's a two-character change. OK, not very much. OK, just a piece of code. You wouldn't notice, would you? It's a corner case. There's this bug in parse double. If you pass in some text, and that text has that particular number, 2.2 blah, OK, uh, then the code, what's parsing the code, will loop forever. Just that, that number. Okay. And it was found and reported 2001. So what? It's just a weird thing. Okay. And it just sat around for 10 years. But it turned out that actually it was a really, really good bug to bringing systems down. Because it turns out that we have lots of places where doubles are stored in strings and get parsed. And those doubles can come in from all sorts of places. Web services, for instance, right? If you've got a HTTP request and there's some headers and it's got a double and you've got some Java code and you're expecting a double, you parse it, right? There's no security checking. It's just, it's just a get. Send some headers, parse a double, system hangs, right? Uh, there's a nice little URL. You can go read all about this uh, because it is totally public. And do you know what happened? It went viral in the sense that everybody had a go because any script kiddie, anybody could try it. What happens if I put that thing in a header and send it off to uh, a web server? It doesn't even have to have... It be expecting it. it. There are ways that you can get the, you can just send it some headers and badunk, it parses it and it hangs, right? It cost everybody a large amount of money because it was so easy to bring your systems down, right? Just for kicks. This talk is, this talk is a technical horror story, really, because so much of the things that I'm going to talk about are really our fault as developers. We haven't been paying attention, right? Sometimes they're just bugs, that's fine. And sometimes they're things that we've added because it's good for us. Um, and then when these things did come out, like that particular one, we didn't really pay much attention because we weren't thinking about the big picture. We're going, so it does that occasionally. Who would do that, right? That little bug is what would be called a vulnerability, right? So I'm going to talk to you about these, what are vulnerabilities, in detail. Uh, and it's all Java-based. 
So the first thing you can talk about is, well, as I've seen, it's a bug that can be exploited. So it's not just any old bug. It's a bug where a attacker can achieve his goal, steal your data, bring your system down, etc. Right? And they, it's an exploit. So it's a bug that somebody finds out how to do something with it. Right? And there's lots of things they can do. So they can bring your system down. Right? That's a really good one. That's nice and easy. And how would they make money out of that? Well, denial of service attacks, they may ransom you. If you don't give us some money, we will keep doing it. Um, uh, and it's just those sorts of, they're just trivial because they're easy to, easy to do. Right? Now, they can get in and reduce your integrity so they can get into your system. They can modify your data. And we'll talk about how they can do that later. Right? And other exploits are getting in and actually running your code or running code that you weren't even, running code that you didn't even know you had. Right? And that's pretty much all of us. Right? And then there are classics of getting in and getting in and exploiting bugs that let you get more, um, more, more privileges. So you can do things that you weren't expecting. So your systems will suddenly find they've got root access when they didn't. And if you've got root access, you can do other things. So you know, that's what exploits are. Right? Now, it might be that you don't care. Maybe I just write code. And these things come through, and it's like, who cares? What's the problem? How big is the problem that we're facing? So you probably, if you're lucky, you went to Siren's talk this morning about security. Perhaps you went to the keynote last night uh, about uh, not necessarily illegal activities, but new thinking about how you use the web to make money and achieve and change people's, people's aims. So in all that, there is a bunch of people who are making lots of money. So let's talk about the scale of the problem. Who do we think you know, are the bad guys? Now, various people will tell you, uh, you know, it's script kid is, it's 16-year-olds who've got access to the web, you know, it's the disgruntled employee, etc. And that's true. There are lots of those, right? And you might think, that's all it is, that there are just these lone hackers around doing things and making some money. But it's not true. It's much worse than that. Here's the killer takeaway. Cybercrime is more profitable than the illicit drugs trade. 2016, right, $450 billion a year was estimated to be made by cybercrimists, cyber criminalists. The drug trade from 2013, now bearing in mind it's hard to get figures from people who are you know, trying not to get caught, uh, you could work out what it is, and the UNODC said 435, right? The expectation is, as you can see, that the cybercrime um, what should I say, um, value is going to hit $2,100 $2, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1,
and I'm going to have got two bits of code that are going to say, what's the path, and does it exist? Okay, Very important. So I run that, and I get two bits of information. I get the path. Oh. Ah, so that's not quite the path of the directory that I actually had, and of course it doesn't exist, right? I forgot to decode it. So let's do that. Let's add in decoding. So now I'm going to use a URI. So I've got the URL with the encoded path, and I'm going to create a URI from it because uh, that'll do all the decoding for me, and then I ask for the path, and I do the same thing again, and da-da, it works. So my code now is correct. Okay. Now, you may not see that that's, that's fantastic, but I was looking for a file that didn't exist. What would happen if somebody had created that file on my system? Right? Then I would have got exists equals true. Okay, no, not a big deal. Okay, how about this? On Windows, Anybody can create, anybody, any access can create top-level directory. So if my path had been, say, what you're seeing there, and it didn't exist, then anybody who got access to my system could create it. So my application that was looking for a file that didn't exist suddenly found it. Okay, so maybe not a big deal. It's just a bug, right? But what happens if... You're, it's on your extensions path. But if your extension path has entries like this, right, C colon program, percentage 20 files, blah, blah, blah. Actually, lots of people have, systems, have things installed and have paths where things don't exist. There are optional products. There are all sorts of reasons why you will have some path where the things on the line don't exist. Right? And you probably won't notice. Right? Right? So... If we had a problem in the JVM, say, with the extensions directory, where we didn't decode it, then if somebody created the path because they got access to the system, they could get, you, they could get your application to run code. Or at the very least, because they, they're putting something into your, your, into your class path or extensions path, they're now allowing you, they're now forcing you, that whether you know it or not, to go visit what they've installed. It could be classes, it could be libraries, right? If it's found on the search path before what you expected, that gets used. One line, right? Now, it's not quite what actually happened, because I'm not going to tell you. There's only one example in all this where I'm going to tell you what actually was real in detail. Everything else is going to be slightly obfuscated, right? And that's, that's for good reasons, right? But there was a bug similar to this in the JVM. Right. So the thing I want you to start thinking about is when you hear about vulnerabilities and exploits, exploits are the bringing together of all these little tiny weaknesses in your code. They're not big holes. Right? You saw the diff at the beginning. You know, you've got to understand what the consequences are. So there's a definitely a whole set of fixes bugs where you wouldn't get them by looking at them. You've got to be in the frame of mind to understand what you're looking for. But there is a bunch of behavior that we do that you would spot and you would realize once you've got your head around it that they were bad things to do. And we're going to talk about those as well. So, okay, so vulnerabilities, tiny bits and pieces, um, and it's the joining together that makes the exploit. Okay. That's Great. So how do they get at these exploits? How do they find this stuff out? Right? Well, in general, if you look at how cybercrime works, there's a, there's a whole bunch of social engineering going on. Right? So they're always targeting people to get them to do things. We all know about phishing and stuff like that. And they're looking. Right? They're following you on social media. They're seeing what you think of your boss. They're, okay, they're very industry savvy. They know how you think. Right? So there's all the usual sorts of stuff, like um, trying, to get your, trying to get the secretary for a boss to do something. If she's new, she's frightened of her boss, a fake text comes in, she actions it, those sorts of things. That's all social media. That's all um, uh, social um, engineering. 
So you can probably imagine that these are all good candidates for being targeted. But so are we, right? Because the bad guys prey on the weak, the vulnerable and ignorant, right? And, and that's us, right? Because they want to target us because we know the inside story. We know what the code is. In fact, we share the code on GitHub, right? We tend to run with better privileges than others. We are very trusting. We are super trusting. How many people here have, have downloaded some code from Maven Central? Or have done app get install something on Linux? Yes? Okay. Now, I bet you, in a commercial sense, if you were doing it on your company, you might be going there and going, what's the license? But I bet you don't check the providence. What do I think about the people who write this code? How do I know that it's any good? How do I know it's not written by a bunch of guys in Russia or hacking the world, right? Or any part of the world, right? right? We do that all the time, right? We are, and we willfully ignore security matters, right? And so they go after us. Now, you might not agree. You might go, no, no, that's not me. I'm really clever. I don't do bad things, okay? Well, how many of you have done things like this? How many of you have Googled for getting Java to accept all the certs over HTTPS? How to trust in the SSL certificate? Yeah, I've done it. Yeah, come on. And see, same reaction. Every time I do this talk, nobody puts their hands up. Nope, I never did that. No, thank you. Thank you. Honesty. Yes, okay. Right. Sorry? Yeah, that's what they all say. Yeah, right. Has any ever written one of these? The trust manager, the important bit's the bit in red. You know what you do, you go, oh, I've got a self-signed certificate from a server and I've got to trust it. Oh no, I'm just, how do I do that? I don't know how to use security manager. I'll just write, just write my own trust manager because I can and it'll just trust everything, right? You know, we've all done that. We do it all the time. Everybody does it, right? How bad can it be? I did a GitHub search for Implements Trust Manager a couple of years ago, and 72,000 hits. Not all code, some text, but I think you'll like some of the text. A very trusting trust manager that accepts everything. A very friendly accepting trust manager factory allows anything through. Some of this stuff is in the code that you may have downloaded when you put a dependency into your Maven POM. Because that's what we do, right? So it turns out that this sort of stuff, this feature that we do, we can add to the list. So it's not just bugs, it's also features. It's things that we've added in for our own benefit are discovered and exploited by the bad guys. Right. And they're out all the time. There are good guys, white hats, researchers, who are trying to find these things for us, all these, all these vulnerabilities. Very inventive, looking at ways to join things together to make things happen. But the bad guys are out there too, and they are super organized. Right? They are out to get us, because they make loads of money, and nobody's stopping them. Right, now I'm going to take a pause because I'm going to talk about the processes of how Java vulnerabilities get managed, because this is a Java vulnerabilities talk. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this first, and then we'll go back to some more code, because this is, it's important to understand how this works. Um, so there's CVEs, Common Vulnerabilities uh, and Exposures. Website, this is a global thing. This isn't a Java thing. It's a bunch of cybersecurity guys getting together and tracking the vulnerabilities. Right. Sometimes the vulnerabilities are exploitable across platforms. Sometimes they're language specific. Sometimes it's an algorithm, whatever. They're all tracked so that we can all talk about them. Right. So you can imagine Java, IBM produces a Java stack, and Oracle produces one, and Red Hat does one. You'd like to know that that particular vulnerability is fixed in all those places. So you have these sorts of things. Right. So you know what it is. If you go to this website, and I just updated this this morning. Um, they've got a search, and I said search for Java, and I got 692, which are the ones on that one. You're right. Um, and that's those ones there. That's just the first ones. 
I also did a search for Java and serialization, which is the 19 on that side. And you can search for any program language you like, and you'll find lots of nice lists. Okay? So if you dig into one of those, you get something like this. So this is not from that list. This is from May. Um, but there's the CVE number. There's some descriptions. Gives you some sense of what's going on. Serialization failure. Serialization failure. Oh, serialization failure. Okay. So, you can, so now you're going to say, that's really good. Can I see the code? Well, if you read into the CVE, you're not going to get any much more than that. Right. So the first thing is nobody is going to tell you the details. We're going to try very hard to make sure that we don't share with you the details of the code changes, even if you're interested. Right? Because if we share it with you, we're sharing it with the world. Right? My analogy for this is sharing detail about vulnerability is like you tweeting your credit card number and your PIN. Right? You wouldn't do that. So why would you start sharing all the details of how your security system works at home? You know, well, you wouldn't. So it's the same here. We're not going to show the details, right? Well, but what we can do is help you understand how to assess the, the problem, right? So CV, CVSS, you can see all the words. Basically, there's a bunch of guys who manage all this and are trying to assess the... the um, vulnerability from a whole bunch of things, from a whole bunch of points, okay? And one thing to point out, because I've got it in red, it's not just IBM doing this, but temporal. So we'll try and, these CVs will get revisited as things get discovered. So you come in one day and you go, it's a low score, and then maybe something will happen and then the score will go up. So it's not fixed, right? And there's lots of things about the vulnerability that we're going to talk to you about. So we'll talk about uh, the attack vectors, which I'll talk some more about that. And as you can see, confidential impact. What's it going to? How easy is it to do? What's the what's the impact if it gets it get through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay. The assumption is that you are behaving normally, in the sense that you have some willingness to be secure. If you're not willing to be secure and you run everything under root and you you know then forget all this because you wouldn't they won't be able to assess it for you, right? But you can imagine lots of effort goes into trying to assess the impact because we've got to put effort into fixing these things and you've got to put make some decisions about taking the update. Right? So we'll send out Oracle will do CPU advisories, IBM if you want Java we've got security bulletin so some more links there. Information comes out telling you that there are these high impact severities that are going to be fixed um, in the particular release. You can go to the website, the CVA website, and find out what the details are. You won't find the code. And if you want to find the code, you have to go work hard to find that. Okay. So that's how we tell you right, the process. If you find one yourself, then report it responsibly. As I said, don't share it. Okay? There's, there are, if you, when you get the slide deck, on, when I put up on SlideShare, you can take the links if you, if you want to go do it. Report to the various organizations as you care. Um, but please don't shout about it. Right? Don't mail it. Right? Don't put it on forums. I say don't sell it to the bad guys, but of course, if you're that way inclined, then that's not really going to be a warning you're going to um, follow. Uh, but don't worry about how how severe you think it is, right? If you think you found something that's a denial of service thing, or um, I don't know, it elevates security, any of those little bugs, just report it, because as you saw at the beginning, it's the little things that get joined together. You're never going to find this graping hole that you can drive a truck through. It's just not like that. Right? So when you've done that or when we found them, or the, white, the researchers have found them, um, what are we going to do? So the first thing is, well, we're going to assess them, or put some information together. We're going to figure out how to fix them. And as you can imagine, this costs time and money. So we're going to try and get the ones fixed as possible, as fixed as quickly as possible, based on those, those priorities. Right? And if we find something that's super, super important, 
there will be some out-of-band release process where we'll deliver something quicker. You can bet that if that happens, it's really important for you to put that fix in. Now, when you're assessing how you apply this stuff, well, the rules are not quite not quite right because what they say to you is have a look at the list of components that the CVE is applied to. So for instance, JAXP. If you don't use JAXP and the CVE says it's for JAXP, you'd go, no, no, not going to use that. Okay. So you can go through all this stuff and assess them and make some decisions. But my experience with all this is, is actually you don't know what your code does because you don't know if you're vulnerable, right? Because you don't know what your dependencies are. Now, you may have sat there and gone, hey, I've got my POM file or whatever, and I've installed things, or app get, I've installed something. And then what does it drag in? Other things, and other things, and other things, right? So in general, nobody actually knows what the dependency tree looks like. And nobody really cares other than just how big it is. Right. So how do you know that something five layers down doesn't use JAXP? So again, I'm going to switch back to some more about the processes. So this is, this is just overview of how some of this stuff happens. So you can think about this. So attack vectors are obviously, how do these guys get into your system? So the, f the, the first one is untrusted code. It's like, how can I run code that bypasses or escapes the security manager? Right. Now, I know a lot of people don't use security managers right, because they can be complicated. But if you have a security manager, um, then untrusted code is, is vulnerabilities that let you get past that. Right. Oh, and by the way, vulnerabilities aren't just in Java. They're in the C code right? of the VM and of the native libraries that you're running. Right? It's not just Java. Right? So the point is, untrusted code is all about this. How do I get access? Can I run some of your code to get access to data? Can I, can I raise, raise privileges and stuff like that? Uh, and obviously, that's what the security manager is trying to prevent you doing. But there are always places where you can find a way around it. And if you have a security manager, it's not going to stop these denial of service attacks because that's coming in and finding these weaknesses where you end up spinning. Right? Then there's the, it has its own section, plugin and web start. Java has not a very good security reputation, as we all know. And the biggest reason was the first of those in the list was the plugin, right? 60, 70% of all the vulnerabilities um, reported fixed are in the plugin, right? And as you know, uh, it's been deprecated in Java 9. And the idea is, well, use WebStar or basically use something else. Right? The reason that it was so vulnerable was because it had its fingers in so many places. And it wasn't enormously well architected. Right principles, but at the end of the day, you know, just too hard. So it was actually better to get rid of it. And let's be honest, it's killed itself because how many times do you see an applet on a web page now? Right. So code, poor systems like the plugin. Uh, untrusted data is the other one. This is the one where, they, where we're saying, hey, you must validate the data that you get in. And everybody keeps saying that to you. Oh, that's OK. I want you to think beyond uh, text, right? I want you to think about uh, other forms of information like images, etc. It happens so often when you've got an application, right, where you're saying, I'll oh, take stuff in. And you do little things like denial of service. How about a denial of service attack from an image, right? So, uh, an example I had was recently I was uploading an image to a website that said, uh, this image can only be no, should be no more than one meg. And I uploaded a 10 meg image. Right? Didn't complain. If I had lost people doing that, maybe I could have brought the system down. Right? And then just generally, we're so open to taking data in without validating. 
right? And there are lots of vulnerabilities around that space. And you can even get things like images to run code for you. There's this little bug in JPEG, and I said about hard in, in native code as well as Java. There was this lovely image, not of a cat, this is just for example, but the image exploited a buffer overflow in the JPEG format, which is written in C, uh, in such a way that you could run arbitrary code. So I could embed in the image some instructions, right? And I had a side of payload, a nasty little payload, right? That you didn't see because the uh, it wasn't visible in the image, and and now I'm into your system. How about other ways of getting into your system? Okay, so this is complicated code, but you will recognize this. Well, maybe you won't recognize this, we'll see. So, in the top blue box, so this is a real one. This has been around in the press. It's been well defined, which is why that URL gives you the, will take you to all this information. So, blue box at the top, content type, and as you can see, it's all a bit strange. It doesn't really look like a comp content type at all. And in fact, it seems to be doing some sort of runtime exec in there, right? So actually, it's not bogus. It's in this form called OGNL, right? And if you look carefully, you can see at the top line, it says multi-part slash form dash data, right? But that's a programming language, right? And Apache Struts uses this. So what Apache Struts does is it went, does the content type of this request match multi-part form data? Yes, because it did, because it saw it in there. So it tries to parse it as forms data, because that's what's coming in. Um, and the forms data, the parsing of the forms data, fails because it's not valid forms data. Okay, the thing is, as that forms data valid failure is processed, struts calls the OGNL Co, um, parser to build up an error message, and a part of that is it executes the code because it forms, it runs that code. Right? Does anybody have a guess at which famous company this is? No? Equifax. So the one that you've been hearing about, right, was that bug. Right? That was a bug where it was the driving of some helpful code to create error messages that executed code, right? Boom. So that's, that's untrusted data and untrusted code. And then there are other ones like cryptographic issues. So these are the ones where you've probably heard about, they have nice names like Poodle and Heartbleed and stuff like that. They're protocol flaws. So when somebody discovers a flaw in the protocol, we are really hosed, and then we have to do something about moving up or changing the protocol. Um, there are lots of examples about those. Again, they do things that maybe you, weren't, you wouldn't recognize as being a real problem. But so, for instance, uh, Heartbleed was one where you can make a request to a server, and you're supposed to ask for four bytes, but if you ask for more than four bytes, you got more than four bytes. And what you basically got was contents of memory. And if you keep asking and asking and asking, then you just get random sections of the memory. But of course, it's memory. So what's in memory? Passwords, access, all sorts of information, customer data, right? And by the user being, the, the bad guys being persistent, they actually stole the data, right? So uh, Java, lots of implementation flaws, as you'd expect, in other program languages as well. Right? Uh, and these cryptographic things, well, you can have denial of service, um, but basically, um, if there's a problem in the protocol, then we have a problem, because people, everybody, everybody can understand the protocol. It's not a flaw in the code, it's the flaw in the implementation. Right? So cryptographic issues that turn up on the list are things that you have to pay attention to. Right? And then the last one is about local vectors. So again, this is one where people go, no, this isn't possible. This is where you're saying the only person you can actually 
run this or use this is the person who has access to the system, right? And if you think about it, you'd say, well, if I have access to the system and I have root access, I can do anything, right? Fair enough. So all these things, like adding things to unexpected locations, like I showed you at the beginning, um, just installing bad code, right? Most of the vectors that are the CVs that um, the vulnerabilities that get seen with that will have a low score because the assumption is, is that you're controlling access. But that's beginning to change because you may think that you're not vulnerable to local attacks. Okay? But again, let me show you something. Anybody, does anybody know what this is? Ah, wanna cry. So if you were really unlucky, you would have received one of these, right? which was your system's been encrypted. There behind the scenes are a bunch of technologies that you can buy off the shelf that make use of exploits in Windows, etc., to deliver payloads to your system. So this basically was run as you. This is a local, this is a code that runs on your system, local user access, right? Now, as an aside, it turns out that the WannaCry guys, right? Let me go a bit further. So the WannaCry guys who put this together, I mean, they brought many things down. They brought uh, the UK, they brought the National Health Service down. As I said, India brought, cleared, closed all the ATMs, right? Nissan and Renault, all their production, right? You look at the scale of that. 250,000 computers, right? Boom, boom, boom. Due to a combination of vulnerabilities that got them to that point. The really sad piece of all this is that as far as the Bitcoin owners are concerned, oh, that's the other thing. The other reason that ransom, ransomware is taking off is because you can get anonymous Bitcoins so that you can actually make money without being tracked, right? But the guys who did this, <laughs> guys, the guys who did this got interviewed. I'm quite sure how they got interviewed, but they got interviewed. And they said that it was a failure for them because they didn't make very much money um, and not, not actually people, most people didn't want to pay. And they said they were going to have to try better. Right. Okay. So let's talk about some more examples of vulnerabilities. Um, Deserialization. Yes. I don't, I could do a whole talk on this and I have done whole talks on this. Uh, what happens here is really the fundamental is, is you have a serialization form. Take your Java, you turn it to byte form. If your byte form is exposed, somebody can get in the middle, can get access to it. And amazingly, some people take serialization as a form and they stick it out in cookies because it's easy, right? So if your serialization form is exposed, then people can hack it. And if, you're, if you've got read objects in there, so if you're basically, if you've got an object, a class that's got fields that are object types, then, then you're dead because people can, you can legally get your object to be instantiated um, to create another objects. And what they do is this thing called gadget chains, which is basically scouring the world, the code, looking for places where you have some piece of, some piece of Java code that have ultimately gets you to doing something like um, runtime.exec. So if I find a piece of code that does that, can I create a serialized form of objects that will end up running that. Okay, clever to do that, and then serialize the form, inject it into your payload, and away you go. Right? And as it says, there was this prominent one, the Apache's Common. Again, it was a thing we knew was possible, and then somebody did it. Right? So, uh, as in Java this year, they said about the, the whitelisting, so that that will, be, that will help you manage it. But the fundamental problem is, is that, as you probably heard when Stuart was talking about it, um, nobody really wants serialization around. You know, it was, it was a flawed idea, and we're reaping the benefits. Uh, so it's quite hard to do serialization exploits. You need to know what you're doing. You've got to work hard. Um, but there are other ones where it's really easy. Um, a particular well-known bank, or a banking-type company, uh, a few years ago, did something rather silly. They decided that it would be good to have the debug available on all their servers. 
so that it was easy to debug remotely. Uh, but when they said remotely, they didn't realize that they'd exposed it on the internet. And so this researcher, doing a simple port scan, found the JDW port and went in. JDWP has no security controls. If you let that port open, people will come in and they will have access to your system. They have access to your running memory. They can do whatever they want. Right? The reason I put this on here is, is it's not even complicated things or even one-liners. It's simple behavior that we do. Things that are good for us. Things that we do that help others. Right. right. So I have some more code uh, just to explain how we're helpful. So here's a class um, that's got a properties uh, object at the top. And it's going to do some helpful class loading for you. So it's got a map. And you can see default equals foo.stringhandler. Foo means com.ibm.run, etc. Right? And there's a little method that says, given a handler, it'll look up in the properties, find the corresponding value, and try and create the class, instantiate the class. And if it doesn't work, it'll throw an exception. Okay? Uh, so there we go. I'm going to try and run it. There's the values in the, uh, in the map, in the property on the top right. So if I run it the first time and I say let load class helpfully for default, right? Ooh, that works. I get the class because it was in the map, right? If I do it again um, and I use foo, okay, what do I get? Oh, I get class not found. Because even though I had it in the map, I forgot to have it on the class path. Okay? And I get an error back. So it says class not found, could not create class for handler foo with that value. Okay? Cool. What happens if I ask for something that's not in the map altogether? How about if I try hmm, java.ext.ders? And I run this, what do I get? Ooh. I get a nice little error message that says for that property, it couldn't find a class with the value of my extensions path. Right. Oh, let's go back. Let me finish this off. So the reason that that happened was because I didn't show it in the code because that would have given the game away. But in reality, real bug, reality, the, object, the property object that I created was backed by system properties. So anything that wasn't found in it it went down the next level, right? So the point is, something like that helpful code, so if I can call your code, however I do it, and you're helpful and tell me, this thing doesn't work, here's some more data to help you figure it, uh, I now give away secrets. I'm giving away full access to my system, right? So you can see things, right? I can get code to execute in your system, I can tell, get you to tell me what uh, the, about what the information is about your system, I can do all that. Right? So I can add to this list, it's a developer aid. So your bugs, your features, your helpfulness are all considered to be vulnerabilities in the right circumstances. And as I said at the beginning, we have all these guys out who are searching for these things. Right? So the question now is, what are we going to do to change this. Well, you can't change overnight, but we have to be better educated. So I'm going to quickly go through the last few minutes, the information that's available to you, right? So one really good thing is this, the CWEs. This is like patterns of anti-patterns, but it's a really good website. So many of bugs that we see as vulnerabilities can be found as being covered by this sort of thing, going, oh, look, there's an example of why you shouldn't have done it. Right? So I thoroughly recommend you go looking at that and just wander through. Start looking at it and seeing if you can find code patterns that, for things that you've written. Right? That's obviously just the, the beginning of it. There's a lot more. Um, there's an example. Um, so that's things like internally hard code passwords for the back end, which you can see at the bottom. If the password equals this, then it's OK. Right? Don't put it in the code. Don't check into GitHub. Okay, that sounds like a fairly obvious one, 
but there's lots of others where you're going to be making basically the same obvious mistake and maybe you didn't know it. Um, the CWE things, they, they have this wonderful pernicious king kingdoms thing. You'll probably have seen that list and if you haven't seen it already, you'll have seen it in different types around. They're all the obvious things that we keep telling you. You know, uh, It's validation, it's validation, it's validation. Right. Uh, there's the Oracle Java coding website. Uh, it is a lot drier. Right? But again, it tells you, gives you good advice for you to understand what the consequences are of how you write your code. Right? Uh, and then there are tools. Uh, LGTM is what I've been playing around with. It looks quite cool. Um, you can point at your GitHub repo if it's public. And it will tell you things about your code, not just, not like, you know, you'd like find bugs, but it does other things, okay? Again, there are tools to help you. Um, there's find bugs or the equivalent. There's a find security bug, like find bugs, plugins. Why do we want to use these things? Have a look, try them out, contribute. But there are tools coming that will help you to make this happen. There's lots of people out there talking about it. Um, talk about Owen Woods, he does a really good talk about um, security principles. Um, and then there are things like OWASP. Again, another set of information about the types of attacks and how, they're, and how, they're, how they happen, right? which you can learn from to understand when you're writing code about whether it's the right way to do it. If you're not educated, you will not improve your code. So basically, uh, one of the things we're saying is be better educated, but we're also saying you need to be more updated. You need to keep things updated. So it's a difficult thing. We're seeing that the Java, community, the Java um, release process is now moving to six month releases, and you need to take those, right? Whatever the consequences are, if you're not into a process of updating then uh, on a regular basis, then you're going to be vulnerable. And if you're vulnerable, then they're going to get in because people are targeting you as individuals and as companies. Right? And there are certain things to not do. Don't write any of the custom stuff. Right? Don't confuse hashing with security. Right? Don't do deserialization. Don't write custom parsers. At the end of the day, it's all yours. I, you have to keep things current. Much as we know how painful that is, we have to do that. We have to be um, updating our code more often. We need to be paying more attention. Good news is things like microservices, those sorts of architectures are helping us because they're getting us into a compartmentalization model. But start going further. Start going, I've got microservices. Who has access to the microservices? Do you have developers who have full access to everything? That's a bad idea. Not necessarily because they're bad guys, but because if they get compromised, then your system get compromised, right? And so those are the sort of things you do. Look at your levels of helpfulness. That's really hard for developers because we want to be helpful, right? And then learn about penetration testing. Yeah, go learn what the bad guys do from the good guys who are doing it to find out how they get into your system. And then after you've picked yourself up from the floor about how easy they're getting into systems, it'll help you start to understand what the challenge is. Right? Um, and I said, there are tools. I've mentioned a few. There's documentation. All right. I want you to understand this. Right? At the end of the day here, they're out there. They're out to get you. And if we ignore it, it's just going to get worse. That's it. Thank you. So thank you for listening to me on the last part of DevOps. I will be here if you want to ask questions, and then I'm going to go and get on a plane.